good morning good afternoon good evening friends depending upon which part of the world you are joining us from thank you very much for joining in this very important webinar which is being hosted by kaho the consortium of accredited healthcare organizations along with monilike and the topic today i think is extremely relevant especially i will say that during this pandemic right one aspect of the intensive care which has been brought into limelight was the management of patients in the icu especially in the prone position however a number of people in the wide variety of icus in the country and abroad have been found grappling with this kind of a management of treating patients in the prone positions and therefore even managing the complications which may be arising out of it so we are thankful to monil k for coming forward and collaborating with kaho to host this important webinar and to take the proceedings forward we have dr parivalan rajavelu who is a very well known face in the field of our kaho he is a consultant surgeon he is has been the clinical lead head of the quality head of the nursing services at the bevel hospital till 2019 and now he is a, again doing the same role at the sundaram medical foundation in chennai i will not like to spend more time in because it will probably take half the time away from the proceedings of the webinar so over to you dr parivalan rajavelu for taking this initiative and this activity forward over to you sir thank you sir thank you so much shivaji sir for uh, this introduction and um, i i wish to just you know um, share a powerpoint with you uh, just one minute okay uh, welcome to everyone and uh, it's just unbelievable we had uh, you know such a huge response for this uh, one hour webinar there has been more than 2400 registrations and uh, dr lalu tells me it is actually a record for kaho so thank you all for uh, taking the time and registering and i hope all of you will join and um, initially you know when uh, we were discussing about the topic there was a Uh, one um, query whether this was too narrow a topic but from the uh, uh, response we have had we know now it is such a relevant topic and we made the right decision now prone position is considered as a potentially life saving intervention and used in the treatment of ards and uh, it is used as a strategy when the traditional modes of uh, ventilation fail but uh, now as i was going through the literature in the last week i noticed that there were considerable adverse events also to this uh, type of ventilation for example one retrospective study showed there's almost a 70% incidence of pressure ulcers and there's also brachial uh, palsy in about 8% so in the as dr vijay said the in the context of covid 19 this topic has come to the forefront and also the response we had shows how relevant this topic is uh, we have chosen today so i just Uh, tell you about the program so what we are going to do is uh, first have uh, dr rahul koshla to talk about the international perspective on prone uh, position ventilation and then dr uh, ram rajagopalan will talk about the indian perspective this will be followed by dr shiv kumar who will talk about the complications during prone ventilation and finally mr vinod will talk about the nursing perspective on prone ventilation and after this you have a uh, um quiz and the quiz will be conducted by dr lalu it is being done by uh, uh, what is known as a kahoot it's it's a fun way to do a quiz and i'm sure all of you will enjoy it so without further delay let's get on to the program and we have lined up amazing speakers for you and i am an, as enthusiastic as all of you to listen to them so let's move on to the our first speaker uh, dr rahul koshla 
Uh, good evening, everybody in India. Good morning, anybody. One, one minute, else? sir. Uh, let Let me just introduce you. Oh, yes, just one. Sure, minute. go ahead. Uh, Professor Rahul Kosla is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at the George Washington University and the Chief Pulmonary and Critical Section at Washington, D.C. Veterans Affairs Medical Center. He completed his medical college from Maulana Azad Medical College in New Delhi in India. And after graduating in internal medicine residency program at the University of Rochester, um, he completed his pulmonary medicine fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas, followed by a fellowship in critical care at the uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey. He's also trained in sleep medicine and interventional procedures in pulmonary medicine. In addition, he is an MBA from the George Washington University. His interests and research interests are the use of ultrasound in pulmonary and critical care medicine, pleural space diseases. He has written a textbook about this uh, you know, um, um, with a lot of authors and also on the use of procalcitonin as a diagnostic and prognostic marker. He has had several publications on these topics. And uh, on a personal front, he's an avid cricketer. He loves to play tennis and do hiking and cooking. So I have great, great pleasure in inviting Professor Rahul Koshla to talk us about the in, international perspective of prone ventilation. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much for the introduction. <clears throat> uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, eminent panel. And um, without much ado, I'll get started. Uh, can I uh, share my slides? Yeah, there you go. Uh, let me get my slides here. Okay. <clears throat> Can you all see my slides? Yes. Okay. Just take this out of there. Okay. So the topic today is uh, prone positioning in the management of <clears throat> ARDS or hypoxemic respiratory failure, of which ARDS, which stands for adult respiratory distress syndrome, is a prototype uh, for hypoxemic respiratory failure, and that's where most of the studies of prone positioning have come in. So what is prone positioning? So you can see this patient who's lying uh, on the chest uh, in the ICU. And uh, what happens in ARDS is you have uh, this kind of a CAT scan. So for those who have not <clears throat> seen a CAT scan of an ARDS patient before, what you tend to have is a lot of dependent or dorsal, as we said, dependent dorsal consolidation and collapse of the lung. The dorsal or dependent portion of the lung, uh, especially the lower lobe, is the one that gets most of the blood supply. So when that is collapsed and the, the gas exchange is affected, so oxygenation, which is uh, one of the most important functions of the lung, uh, gets affected. And these patients become severely hypoxemic. That means their oxygen levels in the blood tend uh, become very, very low. So one of the managements, so I'm, I'll be going through, I mean, management of ARDS patient is very complex. We are focusing just on prone positioning. So one of the things that, has come up, especially in this COVID pandemic, is prone positioning. So why, why prone positioning? How does it help? So what prone positioning does is when you flip a patient over on the, to the chest and belly, it helps in the re-expansion of this dorsal consolidation. And how it does that is a complex physiology, but in short, what it does is there are something known as trans pressures. Those pressures, they get realigned and it helps to open up this uh, dorsal portion, which now becomes uh, the undependent portion. About 30% of the lung in the supine position when we lie on a back is compressed by the heart and the sternum um, and the other consolidated lung. So when we put a patient in a, a prone positioning, the compression becomes less. So it gives a chance of the lung to get expanded. And then I just mentioned the improved uh, uh, ventilation perfusion matching that takes place as the dorsal or dependent portion of the lung is the one that gets more blood supply. And if that got co collapsed, gas exchange gets affected. So when you put somebody back uh, on, on the chest and prone positioning, that dependent dorsal portion of the lung tends to open up. Now there's more, more blood supply over there and the gas exchange gets better. It also has mobilization of secre secretions. It helps greater movement of the diaphragm, which helps in ventilation. And then there's something known as compliance of the lung, et cetera, which tends to get better. So this is the basic physiology behind prone positioning and how it may uh, or may not help a patient with uh, ARDS or hypoxemic respiratory failure. There are various devices around the world that, are, that have been used for prone positioning. This probably is the most expensive one. And I can tell you uh, right off the bat that probably the most expensive hospitals in the world own this. This is called a rotoprone bed. 
the cost of this bed in the US is about $150,000. So you can just imagine uh, cost, how cost prohibitive uh, this equipment can be. But it does uh, make the pruning of the position easier for the staff to do. But management of the patient can be complex. As you can see, the patient is all tied up. Then there are other, uh, this is a striker bed that has been used. Some patients, as in the OR, patients are just flipped over onto some, uh, you know, extra cushions. Or you can use uh, other devices. This is called a old man's positioner. So long story short, various devices uh, are there that are used to help uh, prone patients. Now, just a very brief uh, uh, history about prone positioning. Uh, prone positioning has been tried since the 1970s. The first patient that was prone in literature published was in 1976. And after that, numerous small trials that came out, but none of them, none of them showed a benefit in mortality. That is the uh, end mark of any uh, important uh, 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 study result. All, they, all of them were showing an improvement in oxygenation and most of the improvement in oxygenation uh, tended to last for a few hours. And Gattinoni is actually one of the leading authors uh, in ARDS, and uh, he also published a lot in uh, prone positioning. So none of these trials were showing a benefit in prone positioning. So I'll come to later as to experience of prone positioning, why that is important. But then this trial came out, this is called the ProSeva trial. This was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. And this was done in France. And this was the first trial, a large multi-center trial, which showed a, a mortality benefit in patients who were prone. So these patients, uh, just briefly, these patients were all the uh, good things were being done for these patients. The most important thing for a patient with ARDS, hypoxemic respiratory failure is um, low tidal volume ventilation. So they followed that both in supine and prone positioning group. And what they found is that the patients who uh, were prone for at least 16 hours and the, the patients who were enrolled in the study had a PAO2. PAO2 is the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. FiO2 is the amount of oxygen that has been given to the patient. When that ratio was less than 150, these were the patients who were enrolled. And when they were enrolled for, prone for at least 16 hours a day, they found that these patients, there was a mortality benefit, significant mortality benefit. And uh, this was published in 2013. Now just keep that in mind, uh, 2013, and then prior to that, a lot of small trials that were done, which did not show mortality benefit. Now we come to COVID era. So COVID has been there for the last couple of years, torturing the world. And people have been struggling and now we are far ahead. We have a lot of things that we can do, but in the ICU, when a patient comes sick with COVID pneumonia and hypoxemic respiratory failure, uh, one of the things that people have started doing is prone positioning. And many trials have been published. This is one of them. And again, I won't go into detail. And what they're showing is there is some mortality benefit in ventilated patients who have been prone. And also something else that you may have noticed, and I'm not sure if you're practicing, something known as awake proning. These are non-ventilated patients who are requiring high oxygen or are using <clears throat> uh, non-invasive ventilator devices. They have also been prone. Uh, their protocol is a little bit different. The physiology more or less is similar. And this is another one of the trials that has been published where they had about 1,000 patients, 550 in each group. And what they have shown is not a benefit in mortality in these patients, but what they no noticed was that the incidence of escalation of care, which was intubation, was lower in the patients who were prone. So we are seeing um, a wide uh, variety of use of prone positioning, both intubated and non-intubated patients, especially in the COVID pan uh, pandemic. So what has our experience been? And this is where, if you remember the study that I just talked about, now, even though we are talking about prone position, I can tell you one thing, even now, there was just a study that was published in JAMA Critical Care. The worldwide institutional use of prone positioning during COVID pandemic is 16 to 18%. And we'll talk about as to why even now it is not very widely used. So our experience, I will divide it into two phases, pre-COVID era and uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic. In the pre-COVID era, again, I'll divide into two parts. One is before the uh, French study came out and after the French study came out. Before the French study came out, we hardly ever proned anybody. And the reason was, one, it is not easy to do. Two, you need trained staff to do it. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of issues. We'll talk about complications later on. I think there's a presentation and I'll mention it briefly. Third is, in order to maintain an experience of any process, you need patients to come on a regular basis. And ARDS is not something that was happening on a very frequent basis prior to uh, COVID pandemic. You will see a patient every two or three weeks. 
And that probably is not enough to maintain the experience of a large ICU with a lot of staffs uh, that is over there. Uh, you need something to happen on a frequent basis to maintain your skills. And if you're not seeing any mortality benefit in literature, then you question yourself, why am I going through this extensive process when there really is no mortality benefit? Then you have that era where the uh, study came out with uh, mortality benefit. So one would have expected, you know, hey, you know, there are not too many studies in critical care which show mortality benefit. Why are we not using it? Again, for the very same reasons, the number of patients who present with the ARDS were not that many. To maintain a process and train staff is not easy. And then, you know, if you uh, tend to uh, rely on very expensive equipment like the rotoprome bread that I showed you, they're not easy to get and very expensive. So administrators don't like to give you that kind of uh, uh, expensive equi equipment. Now, since COVID pandemic, we were forced to start cloning patients. Why? One, initially we had nothing to offer to these patients. Patients were dying. This is the first wave. And we wanted to do something that helps these patients and we scanned the literature and clone positioning was one of the things that, was, uh, that had shown to reduce mortality. So we started cloning patients and then studies about awake cloning started coming in. So we had awake cloning protocols also. This is our, has been our institutional experience. But as mentioned earlier, this is not something uh, that is uh, uh, without complications. The most uh, concerning complication are your pressure also. So if you see most of the things that are mentioned over here are related to pressure injuries of the nerves, decubitus ulcers, you will see these patients when they are sick, they develop so much of facial edema, the skin just breaks down very easily. And we have had those complications. And what happens is when a patient, even though the patient doesn't won't remember anything they survive, uh, the thing they'll remember is that scar or the decubus ulcer they have. So they're not very happy about it. Then obviously other things like dislodging of the endotracheal tube, this has happened to us. Uh, vascular catheters, they can come out, not easy to manage. So I think there's a whole uh, uh, talk on uh, complications. I won't uh, spend too much of time on it, but yes, we have seen all this. Now there are many contraindications, but uh, the main thing that you want to remember is the top few of them. <clears throat> you don't want to prone a patient who's very unstable, basically who's in shock, has multiple fractures or any spine instability, um, or it has just had recent chest surgery like stenotomy, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to prone these patients. The other thing you want to remember is when you prone a patient, not everyone benefits. Some of these patients actually worsen. So you have to watch these patients very carefully. And a few of these patients, we have had to uh, put them in spine position very quickly because they went down. They started developing arrhythmias, hypoxemia wake worse. So in my experience, the determinants of success have been, number one, trained staff, extremely important. The staff need to know what they, what they are doing. So what we did was is we did a lot of simulation prior to uh, starting to prone patients. So we went to, we have a small simulation lab. We went there, we practiced every step. Uh, we designed the room over there as to how our ICU room is, uh, where the ventilator is, where, you know, if the patient is on dialysis, where the dialysis machine would be, all that. And then we prone those patients. Um, you should have a written protocol and you should review that protocol and modify it on a periodic basis as you gain experience. Again, as I said, know your equipment, depending on what you're using. We basically initially just used the French study protocol where they used a bed sheet to uh, flip the patient over and we uh, provided uh, cushions and padding to all the pressure points. Um, and then you have to do a periodic assessment of uh, whatever you're doing or the successes and failures. So in summary, uh, in the interest of time, um, there are beneficial effects of cloning. Studies have shown a benefit of mortality, but again, not every patient uh, benefits from it. Uh, complications do occur and make sure that you have written protocols, a proper process, trained staff, use simulation uh, prior to uh, implementing it, and then uh, learn from your experience. So that is my uh, short talk. And uh, I think the questions if they're later, uh, I can, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rahul Kosla. I mean, that was a uh, very uh, informative talk. You started off with the history and then went on to your experience, highlighted the complications and summarized it well. Thank you so much for the you know, um, very comprehensive talk in a short time. Now, uh, it, it is my privilege to um, um, in, invite the next speaker. Just one minute, let me...
Okay, it's my privilege to uh, invite uh, Professor Ram E. Rajagopalan. Uh, Dr. Ram is a good friend of mine for many years. You know, he had a long stint at uh, Sundara Medical Foundation, where I also started my career after my post-graduation in Chennai. And he was a consultant and head of, head of the Department of Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Ram is indeed one of the pioneers of critical care in India, and he has contributed to the growth of this specialty by personally mentoring several students and also through the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. He is currently the professor and head of clinical services at the Department of uh, Critical Care Medicine. Uh, it's known as Sri Ramachandra Institute of Higher Education and Research. Formerly, it was known as SRMC. Dr. Ram is a graduate from Madras Medical College, Chennai. He underwent training in internal medicine in Chicago. He has done a research fellowship in cardiology at UCLA, Los Angeles, and critical care fellowship from the University of Pittsburgh. He is an excellent teacher, as you will see shortly, and he has had several publications to his credit in peer-reviewed national and international journals. He is the past president of, Inter uh, of the Indian uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine and a former executive committee member as well. And he is involved in the curriculum development and establishment of critical care fellowship in the National Board of Examinations in India and in the curriculum development of examinations in the diploma course that is uh, conducted by the Critical Care Society. Ram, I know, loves running and cycling, and uh, he has participated in uh, several marathons. So without much ado, let's invite Professor Ram Irajagopalan to give his talk. Over to you, Ram. Thank you. I hope I'm audible. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I need to share my screen. Let me just get onto my screen. Okay. All right. Okay. The, the focus of my talk uh, is not going to be very distinctly different from what uh, Professor Kosla has uh, talked about a little earlier, because there will be a little bit of an overlap related to the history and the physiology of managing the patient in the prone position. But I will try to blend that in with the Indian perspective, particularly our own history in terms of the use of prone ventilation. And I will try to show you that uh, thanks to uh, a lot of serendipity, we hit that the right formula well in advance of what the, the Western data uh, showed us. And I think uh, it has given us a period of time, almost 20 years, to be practicing this process so that when we face the crisis, we could add, I mean, we didn't uh, really get surprised. So with that in the background, I think basically, I think we do understand that among all animals, the only ones that lie supine are the hominids. The hominids include uh, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and, and the uh, orangutans. Uh, with the exception of this, virtually every other animal lies in the pro is exactly what we do. And as a consequence of this, the evolution of our lung has not been appropriate enough that when we lie in a supine position, as we do, it is very, uh, you know, uh, has a lot of side effects in terms of what happens to the lung volumes. So while the prone position seems to be position, for a long time, we about the concerns about leaving our patients in the in a supine position. The initial data that came on prone positioning, as was already mentioned, was probably in the early 1970s. Uh, I think Brian, uh, who did a lot of work with the paralysis of patients uh, while on mechanical ventilation, clearly emphasized that you couldn't open up the entire lung when you have a paralyzed uh, diaphragm, and probably was the first one to suggest that positioning and the changes in the diaphragmatic uh, pressures on certain areas of the lung will be of beneficial value. But besides that, I think there have been a couple of small series in 1977 and 76, uh, which really this extreme position form of the stri striker bed, but a cyclometric bed. It's like a museum piece on this uh, slide that I have over here. Uh, but effectively, their focus was a lot on the clearance of secretions to try and improve the oxygenation in patients with severe hypoxic respiratory failure. The major revolution in our change of understanding the value of prone positioning probably came with the seminal papers of 
Catanonian monk in 1986. The first ones to perform what are called CT scans and was already shown to you by Dr. Scan in ARDS revealed a certain feature that was surprising to most of us. The fact was, most of these lungs, thanks to the inflammation, were waterlogged. And this waterlogged lung seemed to behave like a sponge where there was a collapse of the significant uh, of the posterior segments of these lungs, as would happen in a wet sponge. And the feeling was, if you turn these positions, patients around in terms of the position, maybe you could use some kind of an opportunity to open up this collapsed segments. And in fact, Gattinoni published the initial study, again in 1988, where the first 13 patients with ARDS were proned for two hour periods. And uh, he looked at CTs in one, one or two of them, but broadly what he showed was an improvement in the oxygenation. At that point in time, there was a lot of hypothetical reasons for the improvement, but the mechanisms were reasonably unclear. Through the next decade, as you see, between 1988 and 1996, we were trying to figure out a lot about the mechanisms. And probably around 1996, we started understanding that the process of proning is also a time-dependent process that probably will benefit from longer durations of proning rather than the short two to four hour intervals that Catanoni was performing. It's between these two studies and before any randomized control trials had already come out. Uh, Professor Kosla clearly mentioned that unless we see survival uh, data, most of us are skeptical about the use of a methodology that can improve oxygenation, but potentially can harm the patients in other ways. But we in India, or at least I in my intensive care unit, was forced around this period of time, long before the randomized control trials came, to resort to using prone ventilation. The initial publication that we had was in 1999. After having performed a proning in, in, in between 97 and uh, 96 and 97, then we had a large cluster of patients with a tropical disease that caused ARDS. I'll come back to that a little later. So are we justified in trying to do that? I would say serendipitously, we were lucky in the kind of choices that we made. As was shown already, it took almost 15 years from the time that the initial trial by Gattinoni was performed to the ProSaver for us to demonstrate that there was an improvement in oxygenation and in survival of these patients. But one thing that we saw in this entire period was the beneficial treatments that we see in the ProSaver were classically characterized by longer durations of proning and by the selection of patients who had only of ARDS. I'm not going into the detail of how you identify the severity, but basically you had to have very severe ARDS and oxygenation failure, and you had to be put on the ventilator for long periods of time in the prone position for you to show a benefit, not only in your oxygenation, but also in your survival. As I said, serendipitously, what we did in 1997 and 1999 absolutely the right thing to do. Selected our patients purely out of frustration. There was a time when these patients would reach almost 100% oxygen. There was a cluster we had. We had a, a large cluster of leptospiral infection, non-hemorrhagic leptospiral infection, which are frank ARDS. And the patients were young patients who are extremely hypoxic, requiring close to 100% FiO2 and not showing any improvement. At that time, we had the initial data from Gattinoni's uh, group, and we basically said, out of frustration, we're going to turn these patients around. But luckily, the selection that we had made extremely severely ill patients. Second aspect is, when we turned these patients, we did it on a routine bed. We didn't have any special equipment or special uh, ways in which we could support the patient. And in hindsight, we probably recognized that what we did was actually quite appropriate. A certain amount of restriction of the abdominal wall is necessary for you to raise re of the anterior chest wall. Also did this for long periods of time. We didn't have the nursing that could keep turning these patients on and off after four hour intervals. So literally what I would do is immediately after my rounds in the morning, I would put the patient in a prone position. 20 to 24 hours, the patient would remain in this kind of This was what 
pure serendipity. Nothing. We had no idea that this long duration and this severe uh, lung would respond to that. But when you look at our data, at least as far as the oxygenation was concerned, we saw the same kind of a consistent response in terms of the improvement of oxygenation. In all these patients who had an average PF of less than 100, I promise you, it was reasonably severe. Average duration of 20 to 24 hours, classically proning. In, if the patient didn't show us an improvement in their oxygen requirement, we would leave them in that prone position even for another day. So it was not very unusual for us to do several days of proning on some of these patients. And probably the lack of nursing at that point in time uh, gave us a, uh, a benefit under these uh, rather perverse kind of circumstances. Now, over the period of time, I think we've understand, understood the pathophysiology of proning a little bit better. So the processes have been continued. The pathophysiology, as I said, is dominantly with a large amount of interstitial edema, which is basically a waterlogging of the lungs. And the lung behaves like a wet sponge. And a wet sponge traditionally will have a collapse of the dependent or the, or the more, uh, the lower. Uh, it translates into the kind of changes that we see on the CT scan on the uh, lung in these patients. And we felt that turning these patients would redistribute these pressure gradients. And as was already explained, there was also other factors like the, the changes in the deforming forces within the thorax, the changes in the, the chest fall compliance, and probably an equi equalization of the ventilation and perfusion all of which were clearly beneficial and probably translated into an improvement in oxygenation and ultimately into survival of these patients. And just going back into this, uh, uh, into, the, into our performance, uh, about the same time, my nurses, uh, Raghupati Kupamuthu and Vidya Rani, at that point in time, wrote and uh, also made their presentation on the nursing management. They were clear in emphasizing that we needed to have a very specific approach to the safe performance of proning. They always suggest we be cautious about who we prone. We need to evaluate and stabilize the patients long before we have a specific protocol, preferably with a large number of as we are monitor and medicate the patient during the process. Then we also guaranteed that there was safety in the term of you know, watching their arterial pressures and their oxygenation during this process, because these were the commonest things that deteriorated. What we saw again with that small experience was the common problems that have subsequently always been reported in studies, that desaturation or worsening of oxygenation is probably one of the first things that we worry about. And we I attenuated to a great extent by monitoring it appropriately and providing the patients with an adequate amount of pre-oxygenation. An anticipated decline in either the tidal volume or an increase in their airway pressures are very typical, and it is not something that we need to absolutely worry about in the majority. But we will also see a large amount of secretions that are mobilized and attention by the So with this in mind, we started developing a, within our own setup a simple kind of a process of being very careful about how we prone them. Some equip, equipment required needed to have is uh, you know shown in this uh, in this uh, illustration. We need a good ambu bag that is available in case the ventilator fails. Uh, we need good monitoring, particularly of the oximetry. It will be ideal if you could have an arterial pressure. Monitor. All sedatives uh, were stopped. Only the necessary medication to maintain blood pressure was made, was used. And then we used already been prominently uh, related to decubitide. Uh, and we took a lot of endotracheal tube, kinking, flood with secretions, 
uh, was also a concern. But surprisingly, our nurses showed that feeding these patients, even with the standard nasogastric tube, was not necessarily anything that was terrible. Luckily, too much of a needing to do CPR either during the process or subsequently. Uh, but in this kind of a situation, we need to understand we probably need to supinate the patient. There are people who claim that you can continue to do the resuscitation while they're in the prone position, but I'm a little skeptical about that. So as you look at it, the focus early on that decube type prevention, we had I mean, head rings that will guarantee that the ear is not being compressed. Uh, we used to put uh, basically water gloves that are under pressure points. We sometimes would use pillows uh, mainly to reduce the pressure on the chest wall by changing the patient's position. And as I said, this experience was something that grew over a period of time. And subsequently, I think over a period of time, even who's who are placed in a prone position. And, uh, but the fact was we had almost two decades of time from the time in 1997 to the time in 2020, when this process exploded, we certainly had a reasonable amount of time. And I think that when we faced the COVID surges, particularly in July uh, of 2020, and subsequently in May of 2021, we were reasonably comfortable with processes. The fact was we were able to transition two patients in you to 30 so all the patients were requiring invasive or non-invasive ventilation. The consistency with which the nursing care and the physician care was being performed, even under this relatively low kind of a setting. We translated this from a better ICU to ICUs, where the levels of monitoring and the quality of support is generally a little on the poorest but I think we were reasonably successful. At the same time, I think the other end of the uh, spectrum, we also learned for the first time the value of awakening has clearly been also expressed. Early uh, arose from the fact that we didn't have enough ventilators to put every patient on the ventilator. We found that when you turn the patient who is being provided oxygen either or not, shows you a reasonably significant improvement when they are put in a prone position. Data seems to imply that an ideal time of almost eight hours of proning is necessary for you to have a clinical benefit. But unfortunately, of our poor patients uh, probably never tolerated eight hours. The patient would probably tolerate about hours, about half our patients would tolerate two hours. So what we would do is again, keep attempting to reproduce. Ultimately, this process too was again started with the frustration, the fact that we didn't have ventilators, translated into um, that was clearly beneficial. This is a uh, meta-analysis of six randomized control trials. Analysis was pre-planned and basically they recruited almost a thousand patients who are given either uh, awake proning or with man maintained in a supine kind of a position. And clearly what we saw in this is the need to intubate the patient and to put them on the ventilator was reduced, along with the fact that even when they were on oxygen support with high flow nasal cannula, the need for the oxygen support was rapidly uh, abbreviated. All of this seems to be a very good kind of a direction. So if I was to give you any kind of a lesson, if you are lucky enough, like we were, to be practicing this process for a 20 year period, the outcomes that we saw with the pandemic could have been a lot worse if we didn't know this technology. I would almost argue that this is one of the most common technologies as long as we don't have any need for any equipment. Execute this even under our service does, and I think it has translated into a much better outcome. We don't have the documented data to show us that this is absolutely, and certainly infer this from the data that is available around the world. Thank you very much for listening. Questions, I'll end here. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ram, I mean, for those uh, exhaustive uh, 
talk in with time and uh, really you know uh, i'm very happy that and show that this technique can be used in a resource constrained uh, environment as well thank you so much for the talk it was you know i putting us i always been a bank venture at medical school and and now a surgeon and and it was you no know, i understood so i think you took care of the last person in the audience so thank you so much for that now to topic very simple the next speaker thank you um let me again um presentation pleasure to uh, uh invite dr shivakumar uh who's again you no know, known to me as you know he actually trained under uh, dr ram uh, for a critical care uh, specialty specialization he is currently the head of critical care medicine in super specialty hospital from coimbatore he completed his graduation from the coimbatore medical college and in tamil nadu and in anesthesiology and dnb from karnataka as i said he did his critical care specialization in sundara medical foundation chennai dr shivakumar is a brilliant speaker and he is also an instructor and in the for the chinese university of hong kong head hospital he heads the infection control in antibiotic stewardship uh, um, in his he is also the currently the general secretary of the indian society of critical care medicine coimbatore chapter and he is also a member of the european society of critical care medicine He takes part also in several outreach activities with the Rotary Club and other voluntary ARDS and trauma critical care. Great pleasure in presenting to the audience. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. my screen visible sir yeah it is good evening greetings from kaimatur and greetings from my institution royal care super specialty hospital at the outset I'd like to thank kago for this opportunity i'll be talking on complications during prone ventilation let me start by acknowledging my teachers dr cardinal krishna and dr selvarajan who taught me anesthesia it is indeed my pleasure and privilege to be along as a part of this webinar so i'll be discussing with you about the complications related to prone ventilation and in the second part of my lecture how we could prevent these complications we'll be discussed about how prone ventilation could be very could be a very good risk patients with refractory hypoxia secondary to severe ards the earlier two decades prone ventilation with invasive ventilation in this current epidemic we saw a lot lot of patients on non invasive ventilation being put into prone positioning nationally and internationally there are a lot of ecmo centers who could put patients on ecmo in a very very safe manner without any complications so prone positioning could be practice in a safe manner without much of complications for patients being on prone for it probably the complications are due to lack of familiarity trained personnel lack of proper protocols and lack of attention to detail these are the prime factors predisposing to complications if you could have a team which is adequately trained if you have a proper protocol in place and you could attend to things in detail and meticulously plan you could avoid most of the complications the complications during prone ventilation could be during which maintenance of prone the complications which are 
accidental extubation or obstruction of the endotracheal tube. This happens because your lot of your mucus gets drained suddenly when you put them in. There could be an accidental loss of IVSS and there could be a transient hypotension which could happen during the procedure. The complications which happen during epipetous ulcer, facial or conjunctival edema, feed intolerance, and brachial plexus injury. These complications happen during when you maintain these patients in prone ventilation. Most of these decubitus ulcer are a grade one or grade two. See the patients who are in prone ventilation. These decubitus ulcers happen so over cheek, in forehead, chest, abdomen, genitalia. These are the common places where you could have a decubitus ulcers on prone ventilation. Hypoxemia, thrombosis, and microvascular injury are the main offenders. The, the patient's age, the duration of prone ventilation, and the nutritional status correlates with the decubitus ulcers. Surprisingly, the BMA of the patient does not correlate very well with the incidence of decubitus ulcers. The cross study, which was published in intensive and and the place Protum, apart from chin and cheek. This is another Spanish study which also looked at the complications in prone ventilation. We all would agree in most of our practice there were no accidental extubation or accidental loss of intravascular catheters or tube blockage. The maximum were decubitus ulcers. This is a paper from Maxillofacial surgery in 2020, which looked at the pressure ulcers during the COVID pandemic and which titled this as How to Prevent This and Underestimated Pandemic. They found in huge numbers during this uh, pandemic when we put a lot of patients in prone ventilation. And one of the cases where they discussed was these patients had about stage three or grade four decubitus. as well. So if you're not taking adequate care, take the results. And the, the next complication is the ocular complication, which uh, some of the this is like ones are acute angle closure, ischemic vascular occlusion. Rare, but timely very, very important to avoid detrimental complications. Why do these patients in prone ventilation develop these complications? One, they one, once they are put in ventilation and paralyzed, there is a reduced blink and bell syrup. And a lot of them have conjectival and so the positive fluid balance and the position. And they do develop a and this in turn leads to a lack of balance. So these all these things predispose to. And there is a precorneal tear film, I think, which serves as a source of culture media for the growth of microorganisms. So these are the ocular complications which you would come across in patients with prone ventilation. The other complication which is uh, underdiagnosed is a brachial plexus injury in patients who are on prone cushioning. And the brachial plexus is prone for injury because of its long pores, and it fully fixed to the prevertebral and axillary fascia and it is closely associated with clavicle, first trip, and humerus. So because of reasons why there is the tension in brachial plexus. So when you it's an increased distance in brachial plexus between the fixed prevertebral and the axillary fascia. So when you Turn the head to the opposite side, which is flex. There is an increased distance. The other fact arm is abducted beyond 90 degrees. There is an increased tension of due to the humerus of the brachial flex. So these two factors, the head being turned to the opposite side and abduction 90 degree put into brachial flexes. Most of the time, it is, it is milder in cells and it is reversible. And in case 
be standing disability. And subsequently, if it is persisting and long-standing, this could lead to demyelination and axonal degeneration. Well, if you have to prevent complications in prone, as illustrated by my earlier call and checklist, in all your team members should be in with this protocol, and you should have adequate training and proper this training is desirable. And the next thing is all your tubes and has to be fixed properly before the turning process. And you could increase the available length of these tubes if possible. Operate your rice tube, decompress your pressure. So these things are important to prevent a rehydration. As Tom rightly mentioned, you should discontinue all the lines and inhibitions which are not during the turning process. And all this patient has to be adequately sedated and paralyzed. And there should be a, a person who looks at closely. The, the last and the important is to have a register in all the ICUs which does prone ventilation to document all the complications of prone ventilation. I think uh, all the ICUs should, should have a register where you should document all the complications related to prone ventilation so that you could review this periodically and as a part of quality improvement initiative, you could try and put preventive strategies in place. This is a checklist journal and put in place during the pandemic. This clearly illustrates the various things you should do in the proning process, what you should do before the procedure, during the turning process, and after the man. A similar one here. And uh, so there are proper protocols which you can employ in your institution. And you should designate personnel and give them proper roles and responsibilities. Ideal to have a person at the head end which takes care of the airway and acts as a team leader. Two on either side for the turning process. And if possible, the other person who doesn't get involved in this proning process but looks at the monitor and keep a track on the vitals. Coming to the prevention of individual complication, the decubitus ulcer could be prevented, I think, by using proper mattresses. I think now. A lot of these air loss mattresses are available, and there are synthetic dressings like hydrocolloid, which could be applied over the pressure points. And the face and the arm ideally should be repositioned every fourth hourly. I'm sure a lot of us may not be able to do that so frequently. The sixth hourly or eighth hourly repositioning of face and arms if you are doing a prolonged groaning and avoid the patient. This could lead to a lot of pressure illnesses. As far as off Complications are concerned. In terms of prevention, it is ideal to put the head in neutral or reverse trendle position. I think if you put head down, then we probably it leads to a lot of And the eyes should be closed and taped. When it comes to taping, I think a lot of us try to do it in a vertical manner, but the preferable one. To have a, achieve a good closure of eyelids is to do a horizontal tapping, and the head should be turned forth early. And there are a lot of silicon based dressing which are available, which can reduce your intraocular pressure. So, the head turning every fourth hourly is important. If you don't do this, one side will be dependent throughout and leads to a lot of congestion and eye edema. To avoid brachial plexus injury, the face should be turned to the same side of the flex down. And excessive abduction of the arm beyond 90 degrees should be avoid, avoided. And repositioning of the head and arm should be done ideally for the one. The last one is about GA intolerance. Uh, uh, I do come across this recent in my some of my recent proning patients. So to avoid GA intolerance and uh, regurgitation, maintain in reverse Trendelberg position, and you should. Put all, of, put all of these patients on continuous feeding to a motorized pump. Intermittent bolus feeding should be avoided. The ideal gastric residual volume is 250 to 300 ml. If you get more than that, you should add a prokinetic. And despite adding a prokinetic, if you continue to have a higher gastric residual volume, you should switch over to a nasogeginal feeding. And nasogeginal feeding need not be resorted as a first measure in all the patients who are prone. I think. Uh, 
we have also, I think, uh, with the help of our teachers like Ram and Selvraj, we have been growing patients for the last 20 years. And I think we also have uh, slowly evolved in our growing practices. And uh, we have been using bolsters in the past. And uh, there are times I think we had a couple of patients uh, in the same ICU. And all the ICUs put together, we have had about seven to eight patients at a time. And the practices have changed. Now we don't use these bolsters. I think uh, they are just flipped over. And uh, these gloves filled with water, I think uh, my tissue viability nurse says it is not going to be very helpful. So we've moved from the practice as well. And uh, thanks to my team members, my nurses, respiratory therapists, and clinicians, I think we have been able to do it in a very safe manner for the past two decades. In the predominant complications were pressure ulcers and uh, facial edema. These were the predominant complications. Thank you. Thank you for patience. Thank you, Dr. Shivakuma, for that uh, excellent talk. You not only enumerated the complications, but also went through the prevention with very good you know, um, images so that you know, we could see you know, how to prevent it. Thank you so much for your talk and for the effort you have taken. Thank you so much. Now, we had you know, three doctors speaking, and you all know that prone position requires a lot of nursing, and without the nurses, and none of the you know, intensivists can actually successfully prone. So last but not the least, we have the most important person who looks after the patient after the doctor does the rounds and make sure that complications are prevented. So I am very glad to invite. Let me just share the um, um, presentation again. Mr. Vinod uh, Krishnan Kuti is the Director of Nursing at Medanta Multispeciality Hospital. Uh, it's a, a super specialty hospital in Gurugram. He, after his graduation, he did his MSc uh, Nursing from Delhi University. He's obtained postgraduate diploma in healthcare and hospital management from Symbiosis. Before his current position, he was a group director, um, nursing director of Nayati Healthcare in Badrinath. And before that, the general manager and chief nursing officer of Max Super Speciality Hospital. He's also had long stints in the Apollo Group. His core interests are strategic planning, training management, people management, and serving uh, service operations. He is passionate about quality improvement and has completed several uh, quality improvement projects to improve the nursing quality, clinical outcomes, and cost optimization to benefit the patients. He is a recipient of several awards. Uh, notable among them is the FICCI Award and also the Business World Award, World Award for the Best uh, Patient Safety Practice. I have great pleasure in introducing uh, Mr. Vinod Krishnan Kuti. Over to you, sir. Thank you. So today I will be sharing I mean, the experience what we had at Medanta. So fortunately or unfortunately, we were the first ones in the entire country to take the 14 Italians way back in 2019 when COVID had stuck our country, I mean, on 4th of March, uh, 2019. So I'll share a few of the experiences what we had at Medanta. So as... We had seen that cloning is one of the techniques where it can be used for patients, I mean, where this hypoxia. So one of the biggest complications in cloning is pressure ulcer. The other complications are already discussed, so I'm not going to go get into those things. So we had approximately 100 uh, prone ventilated patients in the first wave of COVID, and we had six cases reported with second degree pressure ulcer, especially in the lips, nasal bone, cheeks, etc. And we saw that this was something, a technique which is used and we were very much interested in the safety of our patients. In the second wave, we made I mean, few changes and we had nursed approximately 350 to 400 COVID patients. And we saw that, of course, I mean, they were mild bed sores. I mean, for these patients, I mean, first degree, but not so severe in the second wave because of the steps which we had taken, I mean, in preventing these things. So this was one of the quality improvement projects, I mean, which we had undertaken. And we saw that 
this definitely worked out well for us so we actually created a project chart charter and we had a complete I mean, team of initiating i mean this quality improvement project so the methodology is what we adopted was we did some surprise audits to see that what was the patient condition who are on prone ventilation we actually i mean improved the self reporting by not actually punishing i mean the people who are reporting that there is a bed so we had a senior leadership meet i mean where we used to uh, review the patient condition review the gaps in nursing care review what are the needs and which are required in improving the patient care and then of course i mean we did some document audits so we learned from our mistakes so one is that we did a brainstorming to identify what are the man environment material methods and management gaps among I mean, which we found among I mean, through a fishbone to identify why actually i mean and what are the reasons i mean for developing the process so we did a cost effect matrix and saw that i mean what are the reasons we did high risk factor i mean uh, measures to identify and we saw that the major reasons after doing all these tools we saw and the other thing i mean which we did was actually i mean identifying our asking the nurses that what were the problems so the problems i mean which the nurses identified were this was something uh, of course i mean it was not a new technique it was a technique but it was not practiced i mean very often it was not a routine practice so and especially with the complete pp kit it was not so easy for people to work with that kind of a condition people were completely demotivated since i mean covid was something i mean new there was no hand holding i mean and there was no support i mean from the seniors because everybody was always i mean had a fear of that what would happen to their health i mean in working in a covid icu so from this i mean we found that the major reasons i mean for these complications were relatively it was a new routine there was no knowledge update on the prone positioning and the Uh, way the patients should be taken care of of course i mean lack of supervision because everybody was had a fear of entering into the icu and then looking at the practices lack of motivation lack of appreciation because like this lack of supervision to see that what exactly is happening the right way or uh, the wrong way and definitely i mean adding to all these things there is an increased i mean workload for nurses so we tried to address i mean this by running a campaign for almost two months where our need was basically to educate to inspire to appreciate the good work to entertain and to have a build a team work along with the doctors to ensure that our patients go safe from our hospital so this was basically a campaign which we ran for two months and we didn't want to do a classroom training i mean and then make i mean people boring and people were already i mean had a fear of this disease i mean which we have never seen so we did a different methodology of uh, uh teaching i mean basically on a fun and educational act, uh, activities i mean through games i mean for these trainings we did some on the job training and then one of the stark i mean difference which made was basically we did an advanced wound care management program i mean through the uh, one of our partners monleki and the mode of trainings were basically on the classroom trainings and arun i mean is there in the uh program i mean was one of the instructors i mean for this program and we actually i mean covered almost 200 1200 i mean nurses i mean in the entire training i mean for prevention of pressure ulcer especially in the prone position patients so basically the training was focused on prevention tips for uh, prone positioning the pressure points the resources which are required when you put a patients on uh, prone position and the prophylactic measures for preventing bed sore and the nursing care aspects so on the positioning as it was already discussed i mean we actually i mean uh, uh, focused on uh, swimming on the freestyle positioning and uh, avoid, i mean the focus was to avoid any friction and shear the focus was to ensure that the lines and tubes are in situ the and we keep i mean changing the position at least i mean every 4 hours so these are the pressure points which are already been discussed that where when you put a patients on a prone position these are the pressure points i mean which definitely should be taken care i mean to avoid the degubitus ulcer the other nursing care focus points i mean along with the degubitus ulcer were the eye care oral care elimination needs suctioning suctioning was something that i mean which was not so easy for a patient i mean who was on prone position so we had definitely a, so we created a video i mean for uh, this one and we used prophylactic dressings i mean for patients under uh, on the devices i mean we used uh, 
the soft dressings for the eye care. We use the moisture uh, to reduce the moisture. I mean, uh, we use um, the silicone uh, multi-foam prophylactic dressings on the face. So these were some of the techniques I mean, which we used on our patients. And one of the things which we created, I mean, this uh, was basically, I mean, a uh, Indian-based uh, proning video, which definitely I won't be able to share because it's a huge video, which I will definitely share. I mean, whoever requires after this, maybe Arun can be contacted for this. And the steps I mean, we took for sustaining, I mean, this was basically continuous supervision and uh, adhering to the protocols, 100% adherence to measures which reduce the pressure of loading techniques, I mean, on patients. And then there we created, this was another, I mean, uh, technique or another uh, thing, I mean, which definitely paid up in us was that we created a pressure also champion in each of the ICUs, uh, in the COVID ICUs, where they used to manage and they used to monitor these patients and then ensure that, I mean, the care is proper. So we already... We trained almost 54 champions in this who are basically trained the trainer along with uh, three of our uh, wound care nurses and clinical instructors in the advanced wound care management program, which definitely paid good results for us. So these are some of the glimpses of the training. And then we had a poster competition too for all our nurses to see that the training gets imparted and then there's a different way of getting them trained. So these are the certified trainers. So definitely, this was a new experience for us. And in the second wave, I mean, when we when the Delta wave hit, I mean, we had minor uh, pressure injuries for our patients, and patients were definitely I mean, safe out of the hospital. We did not face the brunt, I mean, which we faced in the first wave. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vinod, for that excellent talk. I mean, nothing talks like actually sharing your experience. You know, we can talk a lot of theory, but you shared your experience and you shared your success story. That was amazing. And I really you know, appreciate you for that. Thank you, thank you for that you know, illustrative uh, talk. And um, now we have to move to the next stage. That is the question and answer session. But don't forget, for all the participants, the quiz is on after this. So don't log out. So the quiz is very interesting. It's a game-based quiz you know, done by Kahoot and Dr. Lalu is going to do that. So just hold on for a few seconds while we you know, complete the um, question and answer session. In fact, you know, I have not had much questions except for two or three. Um, Mr. Vinod, do you want to ask anything to the other um, panelists? Uh, I think, I mean, it was not... Uh, uh, a great experience, I mean, for all of us, I mean, looking at this disease. But definitely, I mean, since uh, uh, it was the first in the country to take these patients, and then, I mean, we had two of the Italians, I mean, uh, getting, I mean, sicker, and then it was not easy, I mean, for us also, I mean, to, and then getting, I mean, this first kind of uh, an experience in the entire uh, history of mankind was not so easy for us, and then, I mean, of course, I mean, in my lifetime, I've seen, I mean, two or three patients in prone position. So this was something that, I mean, which definitely taught us a lot. Right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Koshla, there is a question on, um, again, uh, Dr. Ram just briefly touched on that. Uh, they, they were asking, uh, how do we do CPR on uh, prone patients? Well, you have to turn them around. <clears throat> so you have to, that, that is where the processes that you have in place uh, need to uh, you know need to be proper so the patient is decompensating uh, goes into cardiac arrest you have to have um, learned how to quickly put them in a supine position and start cpr you cannot uh, it's very difficult to do a cardiac uh, on a patient who's prone and that is where issues arise um, where especially in the covid pandemic earlier what we realized was that we were losing staff to getting COVID infections uh, when we started proning. Um, now we cannot directly relate to it, but we did see a spike. And what was happening is in these instances where crisis came in and the staff rushed into the room to uh, 
you know, help the patient either they were having cardiac arrest or both they were having other complications. And where uh, issues happened with the PPE that the staff were waiting for, and there was a shortage of PPE when the initial wave came in. And now we really don't have that. We didn't have papers, we didn't have uh, enough, uh, you know, masks, uh, N95s. So you have to be very careful. Um, you have to maintain a staff in order to manage a pandemic. And we started losing staff. And that's where we came up with other protocols where we said, even if a patient is crashing, you need to have a two person check for proper PPE, uh, you know, donning uh, before you rush in. You have to protect yourself to protect others. So the short answer is you cannot do CPR in a patient who's prone. You have proper CPR in a patient who's prone. You have to put them supine and be careful. Thank you, Dr. Krishna. Dr. Ram, um, I don't know if you heard it right. You, you know, in your talk, you said there are some studies which show that CPR can be done in a prone position. Can you? Uh, did I hear that? No, right? no, no. I, I, again, anecdotally is, is basically what people say. I don't believe there is good enough data uh, to suggest that that would be the right approach. So as I said, uh, I mean, physically, it is not possible to compress the chest through a very rigid uh, posterior chest wall. It requires sternal compression, and now obviously you need to be in a completely different position. Uh, okay, again, related to the pandemic, the, the tendency, again, uh, when somebody is on this level of oxygen support has got a huge uh, amount of associated problems, the outcomes in, uh, with CPR under these circumstances are likely to be very, very poor. And as uh, Professor Kosla already warned us, if you're going to do CPR under these circumstances, it was extremely important that appropriate donning and personal protection equipment were being used uh, during this process. Uh, I, I don't know. Fortunately, I don't know whether it was because we pre-warned a lot of our patients and in many situations got DNR kind of options in many of these situations. We probably didn't need to be involved in too many CPRs. Uh, so as a consequence, I think I, I think the attention to these issues are very important. You cannot do CPR in a prone position. You need to turn the patient around. So you obviously need to have a reasonable protocol about how quickly you do turn the patient around. And uh, that, that is going to be quite important. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. So supine CPR and make sure that you wear the you know, PP before you start it. So and uh, there are other questions about prevention of pressure sore. I think uh, Dr. Shivakumar has already answered it. Uh, is there anything you want to add, uh, Dr. Shivakumar, on prevention of pressure sores in your experience? Nothing, sir. I think uh, I've discussed in detail. I have a query to Dr. Ram, sir. Sir, are you around? Dr. Ram? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I, I don't sir, know. Sir, sir. Yeah, we, we all understand that uh, some amount of head up tilt uh, is good in terms of facial congestion and even for uh, feeding intolerance, it is good. But we do come across a lot of patients in the recent past that they tidal volume, the recruitment is slightly better with slightly head down. So have you come across that? So what is your comment on this? Could I suggest something? Okay. Uh, again, the correlation between an improvement in oxygenation and the tidal volume is actually strangely inverse. Yes. You clearly understand that a reduction in tidal volume is generally associated with a greater amount of uh, oxygenation improvement, primarily because it improves the homogeneity of the anterior chest wall. And for the same reasons, pressure on the abdominal wall is not necessarily a negative kind of a, uh, a process. So maybe what is happening when you turn the head end up is probably a tendency towards a greater amount of abdominal compression. Does it translate into a worsening of oxygenation? We very rarely see in it, okay? But these patients certainly do have a large amount of dead space and have a tendency to retain CO2 quite a bit. And this loss in tidal volume makes us extremely nervous about the whole process. Uh, but I, I don't know if there is any other answer. The, the fact is we do see that change uh, when you do a little bit of a head and tilt uh, upwards. And I, I can presume that it is related to the abdominal pressure that you're going to have. Uh, I don't know of an answer under those circumstances. And now it's my pleasant duty to you know, uh, say the thank you to all of you. First to the panelists, 
Dr. Rahul Koshla, Dr. Ram Rajagopalan, Dr. Shivakumar, and uh, Dr. Mr. Vinod for giving those excellent talks and enlightening us on the um, prone position. What is it? What are the you know uh, pitfalls and complications and how to prevent it? It was an excellent session. There's so much of learning and you know just an hour and a half. I think we learned so much. Thank you all for that excellent talks. Next, I have to uh, thank Kaho. It's like thanking my own uh, household members, uh, Dr. Vijay Agarwal, who is the um, brain, uh, who who is sort of heading and leading and mentoring Kaho to this level. Dr. Lalu Joseph, who's the star of Kaho, and uh, and she has made you know, the Kaho to what it is today. And to look at so many participants for a webinar, it's a record. You know, there, there are more than 2,500 participants and almost 1,000 uh, people who are viewing this session. It's an amazing achievement. So thank you so much, Kaho. And to Monilike for their support and, and the technical team it supported us all through the program without any hitch. It's amazing to you know, go through a program of this magnitude without any technical glitch. Thank you so much. And last but not the least, the participants. Amazing response, an amazing participation and in the quiz as well. Thank you all so much and thank you for the opportunity.